So tonight's uh, talk this evening is called, uh, They Said It Couldn't Be Done, The Impossible Musical Adaptation of Pygmalion. And uh, Pygmalion is the source material for, for tonight's show, My Fair Lady, and it was written by uh, English playwright um, George Bernard Shaw. And so I have invited, uh, or I'd like to invite um, our department head up, come on up. Um, this, I, I hope that everybody's had a chance to meet him this last semester or the last couple of weeks. Um, this is Mo LeMay. He is our amazing department head, and he is also the wonderful stager of this beautiful show. Please welcome. <laughs> I'm going to get out of his way. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I also want to uh, say thank you to Jeremy, um, who's the music director. And you'll just hear it's just so beautifully directed from a musical standpoint. Of course, sounds fabulous. Those leads, we have two leads that are 19 years old playing Higgins and Eliza. And you will not know it. They're, they're really extraordinary. Um, I also want to thank Chris, who did the scenic design uh, back there. And um, also uh, Megan, who's not here and did the choreogra choreography and did a really fabulous job. Um, the, I think the most important thing to know about Shaw is that um, he was an Irishman, not an Englishman. <laughs> and well, no, it's it's an important thing because we think of him. He's really thought of in some ways as being one of the great English playwrights, um, if if not at Shakespeare's level, maybe second to Shakespeare's level. Um, he's thought of that way. He was very prolific. He wrote something like 50 plays. Um, but he started out, he grew up in Dublin. And um, his father, hard to believe, was a drunk. And, um, and he wasn't a mean drunk, but he was a somewhat incompetent drunk. And he started out, and he was, uh, he was a businessman with a kind of a, a trajectory early in his life where the business was doing, a way, going, doing OK. And then as he drank and drank, it sort of fell by the wayside. His mother was um, an amateur musician and obsessed with music and um, followed the man that she was sort of uh, mentored by to London and lived with him. And then Shaw ended up living in that household as well when he was about 20 years old. And he started out and he wanted to be a novelist. And he wrote, over the course of nine years, he wrote five novels, which you will never have heard of because they're all terrible. And he, mo he made 30 bucks during the course of his <laughs> nine years <laughs> of writing away. And, and I, like this, I like this quote because he says, people are always blaming, blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, make them. Well, that's easy to say when you're living with your mom for a whole, you know, <laughs> for a decade. <laughs> that's what I want to say to Shaw. And he would have liked to have been pushed back, I think, actually. He then was, uh, he was a great fan of music, growing up in this musical household. He was a great fan of music. And he was a music critic and a theater and art critic uh, for many years be before he started writing plays. And you can go look at his criticism. He wrote thousands and thousands of pages of criticism for music and for theater. And it's really where he kind of learned his trade. And he didn't, re he didn't produce a play until he's about 40 years old, and that was Arms and the Man. And, um, and then it was Pygmalion. And then probably my favorite of all of his plays is uh, St. Joan, which is just a, a magnificent play. I wish we could do it, but it has like 30 men and one woman, which is not the way our department is constructed. <laughs> um, he, uh, I just have to read a couple of these things because they're just so wonderful. Um, he's so quotable. Um, and he was such a contrarian. He, um, he was a great skeptic of English society. Um, he started a thing. Well, he was part of the Fabian Society, which was a, was a, a socialist uh, organization. And um, he got in a lot of trouble because he, he basically, almost everything that the English held as sacred, he poked poked at. Uh, one of the things he said is, the fact that a believer is happier than a skeptic is no more to the point than the fact that a drunken man is happier than a sober one. <laughs> the happiness of a the happiness of credulity is a cheap and dangerous quality of happiness and by no means a necessity of life. He also said, life isn't finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. 
He said, all censorships exist to prevent anyone from challenging current conceptions and existing institutions. All progress is initiated by challenging current conceptions and executed by supplanting existing institutions. Consequently, the first condition of progress is the removal of censorship. We could probably all agree about that. I like this one. Dancing is a perpendicular expression of a horizontal desire. He said, I am an atheist and I thank God for it. <laughs> he said, you'll never have a quiet world till you knock the patriotism out of the human race. I have defined the 100% American as 99% an idiot. <laughs> he said, democracy is a device that ensures that we shall be governed by, uh, we shall be governed no better, better than we deserve. Which, uh, it's really and a last one, this is for Jeremy. He hell is full of musical amateurs. <laughs> I leave it to you, Jeremy. <laughs> so, thank you, Mo. <laughs> I, uh, on a side note to that, I, he, he told me that quote uh, a couple weeks ago and I told him that is exactly for me because in, in my version of hell is doing South, uh, or Sound of Music in dinner theater in perpetuity, just constantly. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked Mo to come up and, and do a talk about Shaw for us to get us started because one of the elements of My Fair Lady being the impossible musical is Shaw. Um, and uh, so the, there are two reasons why it's the, it became the impossible musical for a long period of time. And one of them is that Shaw had a disgust toward the musical adaptation of his plays. And the re he came by it pretty naturally. Um, in 1908, uh, operetta composer, Vienna, a Viennese composer named Oskar Strauss uh, uh, came to him and asked for permission to do an operetta adaptation of Arms and the Man, the, the first play that uh, uh, Mo just mentioned. And now let me point out a couple things about Strauss really quickly. Strauss uh, was born um, with the spelling of his name being the exact same as the famous Waltz King's uh, family right, S-T-R-A-U-S-S. -S. And he so desperately didn't want to be associated with him that he dropped the last S. And his one association with Johann Strauss II, the famous Waltz King, was for the Waltz King to tell him that he'd probably be better off avoiding waltzes and just sticking to the stage. Yeah. And uh, that's what he did. So in 1908, he, he asks Shaw for permission to set uh, Arms of the Man as an operetta. And uh, Shaw agrees reluctantly with three stipulations to the royalties. And the stipulations were this, that he could he couldn't use any of Shaw's original dialogue for the operetta, and he also couldn't use any of the original names of the characters in the operetta, okay? The second thing that he said was that it, uh, they had to advertise that the libretto was a parody and that it was not associated to the original play. And third, and I, don't, I can't quite wrap my brain around this one, is he insisted that he not receive any money back from the productions. That's probably the main reason he became unhappy with the, the, the operetta that resulted, which is called The Chocolate Soldier. You may have, some of you may have seen this operetta. It's fairly well produced uh, uh, throughout time. Um, but uh, Shaw was really upset, and despite the fact that they really stuck to the original theme of the show, that they really stuck to most of the major plot points of the show, he quoted that it was a putrid opera boof in the worst taste of 1860. Um, and he was so upset about it that um, uh, he uh, said, I'm never going to let that happen again. But the icing on the cake was the fact that the chocolate soldier became far more famous than Arms and the Man. And it then proceeded to make far more profits than Arms and the Man. And then it became internationally successful and Arms and the Man did not. And so he <laughs> lost out on a lot of royalties. And he really hated that. So in 19, now by the way, uh, at this point uh, in 1908, he has not even written Pygmalion yet, okay? In 1921, he catches wind that Franz Lehar, who's the operetta composer of The Merry Widow, if you know that operetta, um, has been talking to people about being interested in possibly doing an operetta adaptation of Pygmalion. 
no, no, no formal requests have been made. He just hears a rumor that Lehar is interested. And so he immediately sends word to Vienna, to Lehar, that says, if you proceed and even touch that play, you will be working against my rights as the copyright holder, and I will take action. And he then quoted that he didn't want to repeat history that had happened with the chocolate soldier. He didn't want to see that happen again. And so he was so vehemently against it that one of the most famous opera, operetta composers of the time, far more famous than Strauss, was denied the opportunity to work on this piece. So that's the first problem. He didn't want it turned into a musical. Okay, so this fast forwards to a, another character that enters the scene and his name was Gabriel Pascal. And Gabriel was a Hungarian filmmaker who had immigrated into the US and started making films in the US. Um, before he had immigrated over though, he actually met Shaw as a young man. And he's one of the rare people who actually Shaw liked and enjoyed talking with him. He so enjoyed his artistic approach to cinema that Shaw told him, tell you what, when you're penniless, come back and we'll work together. Okay, so Pascal goes off and um, he goes into a series of processes of trying to uh, create films in India and ends up completely penniless. But I should point out that he has the rights to Gandhi's um, life and he could, he has every intention of creating a film about Gandhi's life long before Ben Kingsley ever stepped into the picture, right? Um, uh, it never happened, but that was his intention. It was the only thing he had left though when he came back from India. He was indeed penniless. And he goes to San Francisco intending of reworking his life and trying to find a project to pull himself back out of this hole of debt that he's in. And he remembers what Shaw had told him. So the legend has it, this is legend, that he got himself onto a train and hid in the toilet to get from San Francisco to New York. And then when he got to New York, that he convinced a, a ship captain to carry him all the way to London. And that's how he got to Shaw's doorstep. Now, the other legend that goes with this is, how on earth did this guy walk in the door and convince Shaw to do something that he tended to be really persnickety about and wasn't going to be willing to do? Lerner, actually, in his autobiography, tells the story as he heard it. And so I want to share that with you. There are many versions of how he accomplishes this extraordinary feat, but the one he told me went something like this. One day, he appeared at the door of Shaw's cottage in Ayotte St. Lawrence and rang the doorbell. The maid, or secretary, answered it. He said, he wished to see Mr. Shaw. The maid said, may I ask who sent you? Yes, he said, fate sent me. <laughs> Shaw, who was on the stairs, heard this announcement and came to the door himself. Who are you, he asked. Uh, Pascal answered, I'm Gabriel Pascal. I am a motion picture producer, and I wish to bring your words of genius to the screen. How much money do you have, asked Shaw. Pascal reached in his pocket and took out a few shillings. 12 shillings, he replied. Come in, said Shaw. <laughs> You're the first honest film producer I've ever met. When, <laughs> when Pascal left the house, he had a paper in his pockets giving him the rights to several of the great man's works, including Pygmalion. And of course, he goes on to create um, Pygmalion the film. And he does so in 1938. Um, and Shaw actually uh, collaborates on the adaptation for the screenplay. Shaw also, win uh, there are three collaborators that worked with Shaw on this, and all four of them win best screenplay that year. And so suddenly Shaw's a little more likely to be okay with film adaptations. Um, he was 82 when that happened. Um, now, I should point out one other really interesting thing about Gabriel Pascal is Pascal was really involved with the development of the screenplay and is noted, both Shaw and Pascal agree to this, that Pascal was the one who created the phrase, the rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. And Shaw thought it was so genius that he put it in the script and of course it, it has a, made, plays a major part in tonight's show. Now, Pascal is going to go on and actually adapt two more of Shaw's plays into films, and it's going to go well for him. Not as successful as Pygmalion, though. He's going to adapt Major Barbara in 1941, and then he's going to adapt Caesar and Cleopatra in 1945. Um, 
Shortly after Shaw dies in 1950, Pascal, who's been Shaw's dear friend all this time, says, you know what I've really been wanting to do all along? I really want to see Pygmalion made into a musical. <laughs> and so the second after his dear friend has died, he immediately heads to Broadway and just starts going door to door trying to get these famous songwriters and lyricists to come on board and write. Most notably, he gets Oscar, and, uh, Oscar Hammerstein and Richard Rodgers involved, and they stay involved for quite a long period of time. I'm going to come back and talk about that in just a moment. It doesn't work out, though, with uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein. And in the spring of 1952, while Alan J. Lerner is working on the Brigadoon adaptation for the, uh, for the uh, film. Um, he is called into this lunch with Gabriel Pascal, who, um, uh, and, and I have to tell you, I wish I could spend just the evening reading to you from this memoir. It is so hilarious, especially as he discusses the experience of eating this lunch with Pascal, who was quite gregarious and um, really just kind of did whatever he wanted to do whenever he wanted to. I encourage you to check out the book. It's really interesting. But he comes to Alan J. Lerner and he says, so I have, I have the rights to Pygmalion and you're the only people who could possibly write it. And of course, Lerner says, we of course knew that uh, Rogers and Hammerstein had been working on this show for at least two years, or at least uh, two years ago they had started working on it. So they, he gets Lerner and Lowe involved and suddenly everything seems to be okay. Um, Lerner, just to give you a little bit of background, you probably, I know you know the names Lerner and Lowe, but Alan J. Lerner um, is American born. Um, he uh, was born into the family who created Lerner stores. Um, so much like uh, um, Cole Porter, he was born into money. He is educated at Choate Academy. He um, is um, reprimanded when he uh, is sent off to Europe and uh, doesn't do what his father wishes. He's reprimanded and sent to Harvard, uh, which uh, Lerner even, I know, tough life. Lerner even makes fun of, you know, it was kind of like letting a prisoner out of jail and that's how you per, uh, uh, punish him. Um, so he is um, 18, 17 years younger than Frederick Lowe. Frederick Lowe is, uh, was actually born in Austria. He is a concert pianist who made his debut with the Berlin Philharmonic at the age of 14. His father, was uh, the, he originated the role of the prince in the original production of The Merry Widow, which we were just talking about, the Lehar opera, operetta. Um, and so he had a great connection uh, with the theater and with music, obviously. So um, his father is um, recruited to come to America by famous theater impresario David Belasco. Uh, Belasco Theaters, if you know that name, um, brings him over. He's in rehearsal and dies in the middle of a rehearsal, leaving Fritz and his young Fritz and his mother penniless um, and destitute in the middle of a country that they were not from. Um, so. Um, Fritz, as he was called, goes on and takes on a numerous group of jobs that have nothing to do with music, just to make sure that he is able to feed his mother and help out at home. So uh, in the list of those jobs, he was a cowboy at one point, uh, the Austrian cowboy. I, got, I, I really want to see that. Um, the, uh, pro, he was a pro boxer. Uh, he was a pianist in a German beer garden in New York. Uh, and he was the rehearsal accompanist for uh, the Broadway production of Die Fledermaus, uh, the, another Strauss operetta. Um, and so these are the two guys that when they finally meet together, and I think I mentioned, but I'll say it again, Frederick Lowe is 17 years older than Alan J. Lerner when they meet, and, and actually all the way through their lives. Um, and <laughs> let me point out, <laughs> it happened all the way till they died. Uh, <laughs> But I should point out that Lowe actually lives considerably, well, a couple years longer um, than uh, Lowe does. Uh, and he doesn't die until after uh, Lerner has passed away, excuse me. Um, but they end up working together for 18 years consecutively and then coming back and writing for another two years together. Um, they had already had several hits by the time they worked on uh, Pygmalion. They had already created Brigadoon. Uh, Brigadoon was already being made into a film. Um, and they'd already created Paint Your Wagon. So they were already well known. Um, and so it was a common uh, uh, idea or a, a sensible idea to invite them in to create this musical. So they immediately start sitting down and working on this collaboration of how to create this musical. And when they do, problem number two with this impossible musical comes up. And that problem is that it doesn't fit the rules of the Rodgers and Hammerstein style Golden Age musical. There are at least four things that it doesn't have that make it all but impossible in 1952 to imagine turning this show into a musical. Here are the problems. One, 
It's a play that is set in a drawing room predominantly, okay? And to go on hand in hand with that, um, they tried for a long time to get it out of uh, uh, the drawing room, to give it a place where it had uh, more of a sense of music to it. They felt like the, the uh, stu uh, Higgins study was just too imposing, that it didn't uh, ring of a musical setting for them. So th that was their first concern. It ties in with the second concern, which was where is the ensemble gonna come from? And, and what world do they inhabit? How on earth are we going to create a, a musical world if we don't have an ensemble to sing and dance and tell us what the musical world is? So they actually try for, to fix both of those problems early on by making Higgins into a phonetics professor at Oxford. And the, <laughs> this is such a bad idea, the, the undergraduates are the ensemble. And uh, Lerner himself explains that it was not only seemed obvious, but clumsily uninspired and useless. And they threw the idea out. The third problem is, is that there isn't an obvious love subplot. There isn't a secondary story to, to go along with this. And if we look back at these Golden Age musicals, we can see that every single one of them up until this point has a secondary or a tertiary subplot that's going along. Um, if we just really quickly look at Oklahoma, yes, you have Curly and Laurie, but you also have Will and Edo Annie and Ali Hakim, right? That's the subplot. The juvenile leads, as we frequently call them, right? In South Pacific, yes, we have Emile and we have uh, Ellie. I just... Ellie, it is Ellie. Yeah. Nelly, it's Nelly, thank you. Chris, Chris McKim, everybody, <laughs> keeping me honest, thank you. Uh, and Nelly, but we also have Lieutenant Cable and Bloody Mary's daughter, Liat, right? Um, we've got in Carousel, we've got Carrie and Mr. Snow. His name is Mr. Snow, right? It's own separate subplot. Uh, in Sound of Music, we've got Liesel and Rolf, right? Even in Brigadoon, in Lerner and Lowe's own work prior to this, they have at least one or two subplots that go with it. Brigadoon has uh, Jeff, Douglas, and Meg, uh, you know, the real love of my life uh, number. And then, of course, Bonnie Jean and Charlie, right? I go home with Bonnie Jean. It's their own separate subplots. But Pygmalion was only about Higgins and Eliza and Pickering. That's all it was. And yes, these other characters came in, but it was really about those two characters, those three characters. And so um, I'm going to read another quote for you about this subject. He said, um, it was a superb one, but the only one. And any author who thinks he can add characters to a play by Shaw is exhibiting behavioral evidence of the first signs of acute paranoia. Uh, <laughs> this, the, the fourth and final problem that they have with this play is that it is not a love story. And not only is it not a love story, but it's a non-love story. Um, there's this wonderful uh, uh, phrase that he says. He says, unlike the original legend of Pygmalion and Galatia, where the play was drawn from, um, in which Pygmalion brought his statue to life because of his love for her, in Shaw's play, Pygmalion brings Galatia to life by not loving her. Even though all through the last act, Higgins rants and raves like a man in love, the play ends with Eliza leaving and Higgins supposedly delighted with himself because he has created a human being capable of standing on her own two feet. To make certain there was no doubt about his intentions, Shaw added an epilogue in which he states that Eliza eventually marries Freddie Einsford Hill, who of course sings On the Street Where You Live, right, in this version. This uh, other anecdote that he throws in is Mr. Mrs. Patrick Campbell, for whom Shaw wrote the play, refused to play, uh, excuse me, to play it as Shaw had written it. And on the opening night in London, much to Shaw's horror, added her own last line. In the closing moments when Eliza is saying farewell, Higgins imperiously tells her to stop off and buy him some Stilton cheese and a pair of gloves. Ignoring his order, she exits with finality. Higgins breaks into gales of enigmatic laughter and the play ends. On the opening night, however, Mrs. Campbell returned to the stage and said, what size? <laughs> and the curtain fell along with Shaw's jaw. Uh, <laughs> He also went on to say, no matter how the play ended, until the last scene, it was most definitely a non-love story. And how, may I ask, does one write a non-love song? <laughs> and so these are very real problems, which is all fine and good. They keep working at it. They, they think it'll all work out. But um, 
Alan J. Lerner was really uh, very much involved with the Democratic Party, and at, in that year, Adlai Stevenson is running against Eisenhower. And uh, it was a, a typical at that time for the final rally uh, of the Democratic Party to be held at Madison Square Gardens the night before the election. And he told, I, I told Mo earlier, I've known this story forever, I had no idea where it happened, and I just love this. He runs into Oscar Hammerstein, and Hammerstein looks at him and says, um, so how's Pygmalion going? And Lerner <laughs> looks at him very honestly and says, slowly. <laughs> and Oscar comes back and says, he shakes his head hopelessly and says, it can't be done. He said, Dick and I worked on it for over a year and gave it up. And then he proceeds to go through all the problems that they found that Pygmalion had in the musical adaptation. And he then comes back and says, those are exactly the problems we're having. He runs back to the country, tells Fritz the story, and two weeks later they completely abandon the, the project. They go off, uh, and Fritz goes off to work with Harold Rome on a project, and uh, Alan J. Lerner goes to work on uh, Al Cap's Little Abner. So fast forward to 1954, and this is the way that Lerner puts it. He says, in the summer of 1954, Gabriel Pascal gave up the ghost and became one. <laughs> it's just magnificent. Um, that same time, um, Lerner and Lowe meet for lunch because they want to reminisce about their friend. And in the process, they start reminiscing about Pygmalion. And a lot has changed in the two years since they have um, uh, uh, given up this project. And a lot of what has changed is that the world is starting to move away from the Rodgers and Hammerstein model already. Rodgers and Hammerstein are still writing. Hammerstein isn't going to die until 1956, um, right before My Fair Lady opens, actually. But it's moving away. In 1954, we see Elvis, right? And suddenly, pop culture begins to move in another direction. And suddenly, with that freedom, Composers were beginning to say, okay, maybe we don't really think that these rules are all so important. And he recounts in the book that suddenly they start going over the problems, and what had originally seemed like problems seemed actually like advantages. Advantages to creating something completely new. Okay, so the show's only about Higgins and Eliza. So what? That sounds like a great idea. And suddenly they found all these musical moments beginning to emerge from the show. Great, awesome. Problem is, the guy who had the rights for it is dead. And his estate is in, as Lerner puts it, is in a state. And um, two women are fighting over his will. Um, his wife, who he no longer lived with, and the woman he was living with. Furthermore, in order to get those rights, they're going to have to convince Chase Manhattan Bank that they are the people who should get it because MGM is also trying to get the rights for Pygmalion. And MGM um, quite ceremoniously calls in Alan J. Lerner for a meeting and the lawyer just point blank says, Chase Manhattan Bank is our bank and we have a lot of money in that bank. If Man Chase knows what they're doing, they're going to give us the rights to that. And then uh, Lerner looks at him and says, is that why you called me out here, uh, what you called me out here to say? And the guy, looks, Moskowitz was his name, looks at him and goes, goodbye. And that was the end of the conversation. And Lerner and Lowe keep writing. That would have been the red alert to say, stop, it's never going to get anywhere because you don't have the rights. Give it up, and instead they keep working it. And to their luck, their agent, that Chase Manhattan says, we are not artistic enough to be able to uh, make this decision on who should get this. So their agent is the one that is brought in to make the decision by the courts. <laughs> that works out just fine. Thank you very much. Awesome. So that's a plus. The problem is that now they have to also deal with Shaw's estate. And Shaw's estate was an even bigger of, a, of an ordeal. Shaw's wife, when she died, had left all of her portion of the money to creating manor schools for the Irish. She wanted, like, in her will, it was to teach the Irish manners. <laughs> Shaw so loved this idea that he agreed that that's what he was going to do, too. But before he died, he changed the will. And instead, he changes the will. This is great. He changes the will so that the money has to go to England recreating the English alphabet to be about phonetics and to expand from 26 characters to 42 characters. And his, right, and his opinion is, much like Higgins' opinion in this show, 
that if we do this, then we eliminate class barriers by the way people talk. Now, of course, the British government had no intention of jumping in and saying, okay, yes, this is fine. But that becomes a problem for Lerner and Lowe because they still have the option to. And Shaw had set it up that from here on out, anybody who got the rights could only have it for five years. So if Broadway shows, quite frequently, weren't making all their money back. Um, Lerner talks about, in, in the case of Paint Your Wagon, they didn't make all the money back for the first 16 years. And that it was only after that that they were in the black and making a profit. So you couldn't cr go to all the work of creating this musical and then have it all uh, taken away from you just as it's starting to get lucrative. Because then, because it's attached to Shaw's estate, and because all that money is going back into the Shaw's estate, the English government could have said, you know what, it is a good idea for us to explore the possibility of changing the English language, and would have been able to take all that money for themselves. They are able to convince Shaw, they take a trip to London for about five weeks, and they're able to convince uh, the executor of Shaw's estate that they're the ones to have the job. In, in the process, they also managed to get Rex Harrison signed on, they also managed to get Stanley Holloway to play the original Doolittle, Eliza's father, and they also hire Cecil Beaton to, be, to create those beautiful costumes for the original production. Um, so they come back so much happier. Then all they had to do was fix the show. And that's where I'm going to leave you tonight. There's a couple things that I want to point out that I really want you to pay attention to in tonight's production. Um, one is that... Um, let me say something else before I say that. Sorry, tangent. Um, that this show went on and to be produced and produced over and over. It's been made into films. The film is, has won plenty of awards and is still making money for the Lerner and Lowe estates and the Shaw estate. Um, the original Broadway cast recording went on in 1956 to hit the top of the charts. Even though rock and roll is totally starting to take over all of the charts, it manages to get on the charts and stay at the top of the charts for two full years. It is the last musical to do so before Hello, Dolly, which is then the last one before we get to Hair. Okay, um, So that's major, right? The things I want you to watch out for are uh, some really wonderfully crafted moments. One is there's a section about an hour into Act One <laughs> because everybody forgets that golden age musicals mean that an hour and 40 minutes is how long it's going to take to get through act one. I do recommend that you get a glass of wine and you carry it in with you. We allow you to do that now. Um, but about an hour into act one, there's a section called the servant's chorus sequence. And what the servant's chorus manages to do is something that musicals rarely try because it's so difficult to do. And that is that um, they manage to create a montage of a passing of time. Uh, they, they're trying to teach Eliza, and rather than sit there for an hour and a half and show us what all went into teaching Eliza over weeks and weeks and weeks, they have these three little vignettes that are held together by the servants' chorus, and they show us the passing of this time from the moments where I, 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 I to the rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. And the section works so magnificently. It's a masterwork. Um, from that point to the end of Danced All Night, it just moves seamlessly from story into music and back um, is a magnificent place. The Embassy Waltz is the other thing I want you to keep in mind tonight. That it, it, it rings true of Lerner, or excuse me, Frederick Lowe's uh, Viennese background. All of those um, Viennese waltzes and, and the Strauss uh, waltz. Um, and then finally, I want you to remember that quite a bit of the dialogue in tonight's production is actually from Pygmalion. It's directly lifted from the play and just moved over and pushed over. I was going to try and get you out early. <laughs> And I didn't do it. Thank you so much for coming. We hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you.